so first I will uh, introduce a little bit about uh, the uh, John Wellington, Mr. He has been like a long time supporter of the Tibet, and uh, of course like and also the, he's the former chairman of the Tibet Society back there in the UK, and uh, um, he's actually the really long time engagement in the Tibetan community. I think ever since like 1950s maybe. Yeah. Or maybe late fifties. Late fifties. So since then, up to uh, until these days, he had been, you know, like supporting the Tibet cause, and thank you so much for that. And it's up, uh, like about uh, Mr. John, Will John Willington and about the Mr. Du Pavlov. Yes. Pavlov. Yes, thank you. So he's kind of like one of the youngest of the youngest, like Australian-based, like politician. And uh, yeah, of course, like, uh, and he's a like, former university senator from the University of Queensland. Before I got kicked out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then you even organized like protests on the campus in support of like 2019 to 20 is like Hong Kong like, yes, protest. Yes. And you know, like difficult, be because of that you face a lot of like difficulties in between that I don't yes. want to yeah. And also you also stood against like uh, the, the, the minorities like Tibetans yes. and Ukrors and Hong Kong girls and like, the, the Taiwanese. And uh, thank you for uh, you know, like, uh, being like a voice for the voiceless people. Yeah, thank you so much. And you are just not the pro, uh, you know, like Tibetans and so on. You are just pro justice. Yes. And thank you. And even like 2020, you were like suspended from the university for, you know, like. <laughs> yes, yes. We know that, and yes. our solidarity is with you. Thank you, thank yeah. you. And then, yeah, and then you even like uh, in the uh, December 2021, you launched a Duke Pablo Democratic Alliance, which aims for like uh, fighting for corruption, protecting human rights, and uh, tackling poverty and then homelessness. Yes. And you've been doing uh, such a great, great, great job, and thank you so much. Thank you. So now, without taking much time, I would like to, and then of course, like each speaker will share their kind of like lifelong journey for like 15 minutes each, and after that, like we have like a half an hour like uh, QA session. So please, from the audience, you take participate in asking a lot of your questions that you might. So yeah, without taking much time, now I will start from, from the John Willington. I have been interested in Tibet since 1952. 1952, I read a book on Buddhism by Christmas Humphreys. I was very attracted to Buddhism, and I am a Buddhist. And um, I was very interested in Hinduism as well. I was interested in both Hinduism and Buddhism. I then went on to university at Oxford, and when I was at Oxford University, I took a great deal of interest in uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and my first job, I, when I took my degree, I went straight out to what was then called Bombay, now Mumbai, and I, I was teaching in a high school in Bombay. One of my most famous students was the novelist Salman Rushdie. Whoa. I taught him in 1960. No way. I taught him Latin. That is the equivalent of Sanskrit. Wow. Anyhow, after, in 1959, I made my first visit to Darjeeling, and I read about, of course, the flight of His Holiness and his followers through Tawang and the Duars. And when I went to Darjeeling, Darjeeling was full of Tibetans. Some of them were refugees, but many of them were members of the Chashijang Druk. They were fighters who were going to go back over the border and continue the fight against the Chinese. So, when, I may, when my next job came up, I moved to Darjeeling so that I could be close to the Tibetan community. And although I was teaching in an independent school, I spent quite a lot of my time also with the Tibetan refugee community. And one of the young people I taught was Dawa Nobu. You will all know Dawa Nobu. He became a great friend. He wrote, of course, uh, Red Star Rover Tibet and so forth. So, meanwhile, um, uh, round about 1964, I went back to the UK to continue my career in, in England. And then, um, the next important thing, in 1978, there was um, a film on British TV made by uh, uh, Dr. Felix Green, who was a prominent British communist and a friend of Beijing. 
Now, what you have to understand is that in the UK, there has always been competition between the India House and the Chinese supporters. And uh, this affected Tibet because, you know, India has an interest in Tibet, China has an interest in Tibet. Dr. Felix Green made a brilliant film of propaganda about how wonderful life in Tibet was since the Chinese had liberated it and made it such a beautiful and happy country. I knew this was complete rubbish. Not many people did know that it was complete rubbish. So I wrote a letter to one of our most important newspapers. The newspaper gave me 36 inches to write and explain what I thought. I consulted Hugh Richardson. Hugh Richardson was the last British representative in Lhasa. He was head of mission. And I became a friend of Hugh Richardson, also of Robert Ford. Robert Ford was the radio operator in Chumdo when the Chinese army invaded in 1950. He was taken prisoner and he served five years in jail in Chongqing. So I knew both Hugh Richardson and Robert Ford, who were the two of the most prominent people who knew Tibet before the Chinese invaded. So that was very important and they were very helpful to me. So I wrote this letter to the newspaper. They gave it great prominence. And this caused a lot of controversy because there were many people who supported China and there were a small number of people like myself who said, no, that is rubbish. You know, these are all lies, you know. I was then invited to join the Tibet Society, which actually I had never heard of, but they invited me to join and so forth. So I then joined the Tibet Society and I did what I could to sort of using my direct knowledge of Tibetans, which was still fairly recent. I did what I could to sort of uh, make the British public aware. And gradually we did educate them. There came a time in the 1980s and the 1990s when generally throughout Europe, the Tibetan problem became fairly well known. And it became well known because we sort of pushed, pushed. And also there was news coming out of Tibet through Tibet Information Network, Free Tibet. And also in the 1980s, it became possible for tourists to visit Tibet. I finally visited Tibet for the first time in 1988, and I spent three months traveling throughout Utsang. Subsequent to that, I became a leader of tours to Tibet for a month at a time. And I took eight more trips to Tibet, spending a month in Tibet each time. Finally, in 2004, as a result of some articles I had written saying how difficult and problematic and oppressive the Chinese regime was, I was banned. So in 2004, I was stopped from going to, on any further trips to Tibet. However, that did not make any difference to my support for Tibet. I continue to support Tibet, and of course I still do. I will just add one more thing and then I will shut up. But I was very lucky Four years ago, at the age of 82, I was still able to visit Tibet one last time. I went to Eastern Tibet, and I had to get special permission from the Chinese embassy to go. But I went to Eastern Tibet four years ago, and so I have seen what the Chinese have done in Eastern Tibet, as well as in Utsang. At this point, I'm going to shut up, and you can ask me questions later. <laughs> 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 Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, John. Thank you. It's so inspirational to meet someone who's committed more than six decades to the cause. Um, I, I've said, we hope that the oppression will end very soon, maybe even in a few months' time, you never know. But if it requires, I will be more than happy to commit the next six decades of my life to this cause. And, and maybe I'll be back here when I'm 86 like John. Um, but but I, hope, I hope we'll see freedom first, much sooner. I'll quickly try and explain how I got involved in the cause. I was 20 years old and I decided I would hold one protest 
at my university, the University of Queensland, in support of Hong Kong, in support of the Uyghurs, and, and also in support of Tibetans. I, I was very fresh to the cause. I didn't know much. I knew much less than I do now. Um, I, was, I was reading about the concentration camps that they were building. I knew about the oppression. I knew that in Hong Kong they were brutally repressing young protesters the same age as myself. And so I thought to myself, why the hypocrisy? Why are so many Western political, business, educational leaders, why are they refusing to speak up very forcefully against these crimes? Why, why do they speak so forcefully about other issues across the world, other human rights issues across the world, but why are they silent when it comes to issues inside China? And we know it's because of the massive economic heft of the Chinese government. My university, it turns out, had a $300 million a year relationship with the Chinese government. Um, 9,000 international students from China every single year, 300 million a year, 20% of the university's budget every year coming from China. So when we held that one protest, the response was immediate. The Chinese consulate, I still believe it was the Chinese consulate, so, um, basically rounded up 300, 400 Chinese students to surround us, get there onto campus, attack us. I was assaulted. I was beaten up by Chinese government supporters on campus at the University of Queensland. The consul general in Brisbane, Zhu Zhe, the Brisbane Chinese consul general, then put out a statement endorsing the violence, saying that it was patriotic. And Zhu Zhe was actually also appointed as an honorary professor by the University of Queensland. Um, so this, here, here we had a professor at the University of Queensland who also was a Chinese government official endorsing violence against Australian students simply for trying to protest on behalf of human rights, trying to protest against the terrible abuses, the oppression, the crimes against humanity inside China. I, I continued to protest. The university took the side of the Chinese government. The Chinese government started putting out articles calling for my expulsion. In the end, the university spent up to half a million dollars bringing in two of the top four law firms in Australia and two PR firms to go against me as a 20-year-old and try to get me expelled, try to slander me in the press. This was my introduction to the movement. And, and straight away I could see just how powerful the Chinese government is, just how powerful it is when it tries to reach out across the world and silence people, no matter where they are. The Tibetan community understands this, the Weave community understands this, so do the Hong Kongers. It's very important to try and bring together all these different communities because the struggle is interconnected. Ultimately, it's brutality at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party regime. I, I continued my protests. In the end, the university um, tried to expel me for life. We got it down to six months. We ended up trying to sue the university as well. $3.5 million, that's <laughs> gone nowhere, unfortunately. I'd be a lot richer if it did. But we've, we've kept our protests going. We started a political party. It was the first political party in Australian history, and I believe even potentially Western electoral, Western political history, that ran Uyghur candidates, um, Hong Kong radical pro-democracy candidates, Tibetan pro-democracy candidates as well. I, I know there is a politician in, in Canada, I think, who was Tibetan, but um, it was the first. It was the first time in Australia, and it was the first time I think anywhere in the world that we had Uyghur candidates run as well. We we're trying to bring together these communities because, and, and this is something beautiful that we saw as well in the campaign against the Beijing Winter Olympics. <coughs> the way that the young Tibetans joined up with the young Uyghurs, the young Hong Kongers as well, bringing together all these groups that are persecuted at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party and, you know, building a big, vast, multicultural coalition against this government. I think it's a very powerful thing when we all stand together. We're a lot stronger united. That was the idea behind our political party. And we ran against, we ran our candidates against some of the most pro-CCP politicians in Australia, politicians that were the head of United Front groups, um, politicians that refused to call Xi Jinping a dictator referred to them as an elected chairman on, on Australian national primetime TV, defending the Chinese government, defending the abuses. Um, one of the politicians we went against, um, he was a lawyer for Huawei in Australia for five years. He was their top lawyer, a propagandist for a company that has helped build surveillance networks against the Uyghurs, helped help the repression of the Tibetans and the Uyghurs. And so we ran against these CCP candidates. We, we pushed very hard against them. We defeated, we helped to defeat two of these very pro-CCP candidates. Um, after this, I helped, I helped lead the campaign for Peng Shui at Australian Open End at Wimbledon, a Chinese tennis player that was kidnapped and basically held under probably house arrest, erased from existence. You couldn't even search her name on the Chinese internet, simply because she accused a top Chinese official of rape. And the Chinese government wanted to use its economic power to silence all, all criticism of this incident. They wanted every single sporting organisation on the planet to look the other way when a, when a top tennis star was kidnapped by this government. And so it was just part, it was part and parcel of this broader campaign where the Chinese government tries to silence people using its economic power. 
The Tibetans know this, the Uyghurs know this, the Hong Kongers know this. We all know this, the way that they use their economic power to try and bully and silence us. And so that's why we led the campaign at Wimbledon and the, at the Australian Open. At the Australian Open, we had just two activists go in wearing a shirt that said, where is Peng Shui? Security tried to stop them. They filmed, we got it on film, posted it up, it went viral. Every news organisation on the planet covered it. And we said, we will, we will raise money and print a thousand of these shirts if you don't let two people walk. If you're going to try ban two people walking into the Australian Open tournament wearing the Where's Peng Shui shirt, we'll raise money, print a thousand of the shirts, give them out at the women's final. That's what we did in the end. The Chinese government was very upset. They threatened to cut the broadcast and they started going much harder against me. And so this year, particularly in the past six months, um, I faced a lot, of, a lot of pushback and uh, threats from, Chinese, from the Chinese government and supporters. Um, I, I went to Wimbledon. I held up the Peng Shui sign at the Wimbledon final. I got thrown out of the final. And then while I was stuck in London waiting for a flight home, I thought, okay, I'll go to the Chinese embassy and I'll hold a protest outside. Maybe some people know here what happened next. I, I was holding a Tibet flag, a Uyghur flag, a Taiwan flag. Perhaps stupidly, I wanted to glue the flag to the front gate. It was a bit of a silly protest. But what the Chinese government did, what the Chinese embassy did, they created an email address in my name. They created a fake proton mail. Proton mail is used by a lot of activists to try to keep ourselves safe, but unfortunately they can also weaponize against us. And so they used proton mail, which hides the IP address. It makes it impossible to work out who creates the email. They created a Drew Pavlou proton mail in my name. And they sent in a bomb threat the day I was standing outside the Chinese embassy holding my signs. And the, the bomb threat read, this is Drew Pavlou. Today I'll bomb the Chinese embassy at 12 p.m. <laughs> Regards, Drew. That was, the, that was the stupid 10 word email that got me arrested in the UK. The London police held me incommunicado in secret as a terror suspect. They, they were holding me on suspicion of a bomb threat, which is a seven year, pr pr seven year jail sentence. Mm -hmm. And they wanted me to hand over my phone number, my, all the contents of my phone, and I refused because I had the, the details of Uyghurs and Tibetans and refugees who could be targeted by the Chinese Communist Party. I refused to give them my phone. That again could car carry another five year jail sentence. So in total, I've been facing 12 years in British prison because of this, this, because of this, fra this attempt to frame me by the Chinese government. It was, it was unfortunately very successful for them because I got stranded in the UK for four weeks. I was held at 24 hours in secret. Wasn't allowed to talk to a lawyer. Was not allowed to talk to the Australian embassy. Um, no one knew where I was. They, they treated me like a terror suspect. And since I returned to Australia, they've again sent out, they've been continuing this proton mail campaign. They've sent out maybe more than 10 bomb threats at this point. Bomb threats against my family's business place. Bomb threats against various businesses in my city of Brisbane. Bomb threats against the Chinese consulate in Brisbane. Bomb threats as well against the Australian Parliament. Just two weeks ago, I was in the Australian Parliament trying to meet with politicians about the bomb threat campaign, trying to get their help. And they created a bomb threat in my name while I was at the Parliament House. The Australian Federal Police said, you have to leave the Parliament House right now or you'll be arrested. So this, they've been unfortunately quite successful in their campaign to try to silence me. They, they've, been, they've been coming very brutally against me and my family. Um, just over the past week, so since I've arrived in Dharamshala, um, they've created bounty, bounty threats against me. So they're putting out emails, again using proton mail so we can't track whoever's, who's behind this, but they're putting out bounties, in, encouraging people to murder me for 50,000 American dollars and encouraging people to murder my father, my mother, my brother for 50,000 American dollars each. Um, so they're offering $200,000 for my murder and the murder of my closest family members. They've also put out a recent email that was encouraging people to torture me. They, they said $50,000 for whoever tortures Drew, cuts off his arms and legs, cuts off his head. This is the sick stuff that we've been encountering. And it's an attempt to scare me, it's an attempt to intimidate us. The good news is I'm not scared. I'm here in Dharamshala. I got to meet His Holiness the other day, which was a beautiful experience. I was so inspired. Because he still has compassion in his heart, for, even for the Chinese Communist Party, even for the cruel, brutal people who repress so many of your families, people who've committed genocide. He still manages to preach non-violence and compassion. And that is something so inspiring to me. And something that I want to try and keep in my heart because I have to be honest. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm a, I'm a Christian, mm. but but I have to be honest. And, and you know, it's interesting in both Christianity and Buddhism. His Holiness even said this to us the other day when we met him. He said, "The fundamental, you know, love your enemy, compassion for your enemy, even even." That this is a very fundamental teaching in Christianity as well. Unfortunately, I'm not a saint. I, I have to be honest. I mean, <laughs> it's hard at times because over the past three and a half years, knowing just how brutal the Chinese Communist Party is. Knowing so many Tibetan friends who have family members who are political prisoners, tortured to death in Chinese prisons, 
having Uyghur friends who've been taking the con- who've, who've had family members taking the concentration camps. It's hard not to hate this this government. I've, I had a Uyghur friend. His mum was taken to a concentration camp in 2021 because they hacked my email account and they saw that we were talking in Australia about the conditions that his his family faced back home in in what they call Xinjiang, new territories, East Turkestan. So it's hard not to hate this enemy, especially when they come after me and my family, when they've tried to threaten death against my loved ones, when they take the innocent family members and put them at risk. It's hard not to hate this enemy. But His Holiness the Dalai Lama, his teaching of non-violence and compassion is very important. And it's very inspirational for me. And I want to try and cultivate compassion even for this cruel enemy. Because you've got to, you've got to stop the, the cycle of violence. You can't let the hatred corrode your own heart as well. You're a much stronger and more powerful activist a much more strong, much stronger and more powerful advocate for human rights when you don't have hatred in your heart. That's very important. That's what His Holiness teaches us. And I, just just to end, I just want to say, the times suit us. This is this is something that's very important. This is something that's very beautiful. The times suit us right now. Look at Iran. People coming into the streets, fighting the government, calling for freedom for women, freedom from the government's oppression. The the, the regime in Iran is is tottering on its feet. Look at Russia, they're losing the war in Ukraine. They started a brutal invasion and the Ukrainians defended themselves, defended their homeland and the Russians are losing. And, and inside Russia, more and more people understand that they've been sold a lie, that their, their, their sons have been sent home in body, bags, in body bags for a horrendous war with no meaning. More and more people inside Russia are turning against the war. And look as well at China, just in the past week, People getting out into the streets of China and calling for the removal of the Chinese Communist Party, the removal of Xi Jinping. If you told me that even just months ago, that there'd be people in the streets of Shanghai and Beijing calling for the removal of Xi Jinping, I would have thought, oh, it's impossible. But suddenly we're seeing people come out into the streets and call for the removal of the Chinese Communist Party. They're they're risking years in prison. They're risking death to to speak out. And the Uyghurs are are fighting. And the the Tibetans are fighting. And just seeing the the courageousness of the Tibetans how you've managed to keep your nation and your culture alive through decades of oppression, that, that is something that is so inspiring to me. It, you are ready to take your homeland back should the Ch- Chinese Communist Party fall, and the Chinese Communist Party will fall because you can't keep power through the barrel of a gun forever. Mao said power comes from the barrel of a gun. He was wrong. He, was, he, knew, he knew he was wrong, because look at how much money the Chinese government spends every single year on propaganda, billions and upon billions. They understand that ideas are important. They understand ideas are important. They know that the dream of freedom is in every human heart. They know ideas of democracy, self-rule, are so powerful. Xi Jinping has called democracy, the idea of liberal democracy, constitutionalism, rule of law, he's called them poisons that, that threaten the Chinese government as an existential threat. If they didn't, if they didn't view these protests as an existential threat, they wouldn't, they wouldn't crack down so hard. They wouldn't so brutally try and repress them. They, they view these protests as an existential threat because their power is quite brittle. They look strong, but, it is not, but their strength does not come from the consent of the government. Their strength does not rely upon the hearts and minds of the people. Their consent comes only from the barrel of the gun. Their, their rule comes only from the barrel of the gun, and you can't rule by the barrel of the gun forever. That's why they spend so, much, so many billions on propaganda every single year and on censorship and on repression. And they cannot win forever. They cannot win forever. Because look, 70 years and the Tibetan people still have the dream of freedom in their heart. And still have the idea of nationhood in their heart. And kept their culture alive. 70 years of repression wasn't enough for them to, to transform the souls and minds of the Tibetan people. They can't do it. It's impossible. And this regime, it eventually will come to an end. The Tibetan people will come back to their homeland. And we'll bring His Holiness the Dalai Lama back to Tibet in our lifetimes. We pray. Thank you. Any question? We don't mind. How was seeing the Dalai Lama? Was it your first time or? Yes, it was, it was the first time and it was such an amazing experience. Um, one of the greatest honours of my life. And um, I will show the photos to my grandchildren one day. I'm so, I'm so thankful that I got the privilege to meet His Holiness. Um, oh, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. I'll be telling my grandchildren about it one day. And I'll always try and keep his teachings in my heart because it, he's an amazing man. An amazing man. It's like, living, it's like meeting a living saint. What did you see in Tibet? For John, Sorry. for John, what did you see in Tibet? What, what did, did I see, see in Tibet? Yes. <sighs> I mean, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, yeah. I'm jealous that you got no, to know. Uh, let me say, I was actually very reassured in some ways. What reassured me was the determination and courage of the Tibetan people who have 
retained their traditions and their religion and their faith despite all the destructive oppression that the Chinese have inflicted on them. So I was very impressed with the integrity of the Tibetan people. On the material side, you know, you have to be honest. There is no question that materially China has brought some development to Tibet. But of course, it is basically for the benefit of China, mm. not for the benefit of Tibetans. So there are very good roads now in Tibet. There are buildings everywhere. The Chinese have put up skyscrapers in Tibet as they have in China. And they have got a railroad now going right the way through to Lhasa. They have also, of course, done a tremendous amount of mining. And it is done for their benefit, not for the benefit of Tibetans. They have felled huge areas of forest in the eastern part of Tibet and taken the timber back to China. Uh -huh. It has not been of any benefit to Tibet at all. So basically, China has exploited Tibet for yes. its own benefit. Yes. It calls Tibet Shizang, the treasure house in the West. And basically, China has looted Tibet mm -hmm. to bring, to bring uh, material to China. They have deeply oppressed Tibet in the various ways. You know there is no need for me to tell you, but I, you could see. I have visited many monasteries in Tibet. I am well aware of how restricted and limited they are and how Chinese keep control of what goes on, minute control through CCTV and spies of every movement in every monastery and nunnery, nunnery in the country. They have also, as you know very well, complete control of the educational system. I was a teacher myself. I have visited many schools and I helped to set up some schools in Tibet when it was possible to do so. It is no longer possible. I visited, when I was last in Tibet four years ago, I visited a very successful Tibetan boarding school where traditional uh, Tibetan customs were maintained and it was wonderful to see it. The Chinese have since closed it down. They've closed it down because it was doing so well in preserving Tibetan culture. So we know what we're up against. That's what I saw in Tibet. But despite that, I am very optimistic. I, I, I am not perhaps quite, <laughs> unlike perhaps Drew, I'm not going to say that Tibet will be free tomorrow. It, may, tomorrow. Ta it may take a little longer. But I do think this is a very good opportunity for democracy to come to the big dictatorships, to Iran, to Russia and China. That is our hope. Our hope is that democracy will come to what are currently dictatorships. I'm going to finish with one quotation. Last week, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guitares, he said, the biggest threat to the planet today is climate change. We must cooperate or perish. Remember those words, they're very good. We must cooperate or perish. Now, how can we cooperate? The majority of countries in the world are democracies or want to become democracies. There are a very few, a very sm there are five rogue states, five states which do not accept international law and do not accept international norms of human rights. Drew and myself have mentioned three of them. There are two others which are less important, Afghanistan and North Korea. Afghanistan and North Korea are not important in terms of international influence. But Iran, Russia and China are. Those are the three important dictatorships. Mm. How can we cooperate? How can we cooperate on climate change as long as they are pulling in the opposite direction from the democracies? This is why it is 
critical point in human history. This is why I think, to, although we are different in age, we are united in our optimism that change is about to come. I do believe this is the greatest opportunity we have had to bring democracy to these great nations, Iran, Russia and China, which are currently under dictatorships. Mm -hmm. When we get democracy there, then there is hope that we can cooperate. It's very interesting on that point, Russia, Iran and, and China, they are laggards on the climate scene. I mean, they're, they're almost rogue states when it comes to climate, ch climate change. Look at Iran. I mean, look at Russia. You know, it's basically a Petra state. It's like Saudi, it, it has the economy of Saudi Arabia with Putin as dictator. You look at China, they always try and use climate change as a bargaining trip, chip with the West. They say, we'll talk about climate change if you don't talk about human rights, if you don't talk about Taiwan, if you don't look at, if you don't look at the oppression that's happening. But you, you see this now. Xi Jinping uses it as a bargaining chip with the, with the West. They say, we won't talk to your climate change envoy, John Kerry, unless, unless you concede on these grounds. And they're always, they're always, these grounds are always regarding human rights, always regarding China's so-called so red lines, which is, you know, the domination of Taiwan, the domination of Tibet and, and East Turkestan. And so, you know, it is very, very important that we, that we get rid of these regimes if we want to have any type of environmental, any type of environmental sustainability in the 21st century. They're, 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 we're, it's almost like we're shackled to these regimes that are going to hurtle us into the abyss this is this is what they this is the threat they represent to humanity, not just in terms of human rights, but also ecologically and environmentally. Tibet is, is the third pole. If they destroy Tibet ecologically, the entire world will be destroyed ecologically. So it's so important as well, from a humanitarian perspective, getting rid of these regimes. Can I make one? Um, can I make one point in addition to what Drew has just said? He has said and reminded us that Tibet is the third pole, as it is. It is hugely, Tibet is hugely important. Ten of the rivers that feed the whole of Asia, from India through to Southeast Asia and China, spring in Tibet. Forty percent of the world's climate is dictated by what happens mm. on the Tibetan plateau. Mm. It is very important. Now, the one thing that bothers me a bit, and this concerns all of us, all of us Tibetans and people who support Tibet. And that is, when Tibet gains, as it will do, I believe, some degree of freedom, I'm choosing my words very carefully, <laughs> some degree of freedom. What degree? Genuine autonomy? Independence? What is going to give Tibet control of its own territory? Mm. In other words, what the one thing that worries me a little bit, I do believe that Tibet will have an opportunity to have democracy and that China will feel enormous guilt, guilt for decades about the way it has treated Tibet and the Uyghurs. Mm. So China is going to feel very guilty. And Hopefully, they will be generous to Tibet and the Uyghurs and give them freedom and say, you know, just as we as an empire gave freedom to our colonies, they will say, yes, you must be free. Yeah. The one thing that I am worried about a little bit, who is going to control what goes on on the Tibetan plateau? Will it be Tibetans yeah. or will it be Chinese? Yeah. It needs to be Tibetans. Only if Tibetans can control their own territory completely can we be sure that the resources of the Tibetan plateau will be used for the benefit of mankind, not for the benefit of China. It's a very good point. I just wanted to quickly say, we're both Westerners, me and John, and there is so much guilt in the West about our own colonial histories. Look at Australia. The indigenous Australians were brutally, brutally repressed. Hundreds of thousands were killed. Their culture and society was almost destroyed at the hands of Western, Western imperialism. Look at, look at Britain's imperial record. We're in India right now. India was brutally subjugated by the British for so long and it was looted as well by the British. And untold millions of Indians were killed in famine. 
man-made famine that did not have to occur because Britain looted India. We're, we're in the West, not enough, not enough, but the West is slowly come to, coming to terms with the, the history of its colonialization. The West is coming to terms slowly, not enough, but it is slow, slowly coming to terms with the history of its colonization, its brutal imperial past. It's talking about, you know, making good on that past history of repression. More and more we talk about the crimes that were committed in the names of our ancestors. The saddest thing, you, you mentioned the Chinese term for Tibet, the Western treasure house. Um, you look at the, the Chinese term for Xinjiang, for East Turkestan, um, new frontier, new borderlands. They're, they're committing the same crimes, the same mistakes as the West did hundreds of a hundred years ago, decades ago. They're, they're carrying out the worst of Western colonization right here to the Tibetans still, to the Uyghurs. And I, I, I agree, John. I mean, one day the Chinese will feel very guilty about this colonial history. One day they will. But it, it's, it is a long time. We're, we're facing an uphill battle. One of, the, one of the things that I struggle with most and I, I get so frustrated about, I wish more people in the West understood that we, we were not the only ones who've ever carried out colonialization. The Russians have carried out colonization. So have, so have the Iranians to the Kurdish people and so have the Chinese to the Uyghurs and Tibetans. Sometimes people in the West, um, Western progressives, sometimes they, they've got a blind spot when it comes to Tibet and it comes to Uyghurs. They say, oh, China is a member of the global South. Therefore, you know, the Western imperialists should, not, uh, should avoid criticizing it. But in fact, China is the world's last empire. China and Russia are the world's last empires. They're, they're carrying out brutal colonization that the West tried to leave behind decades ago. And this is, this is the hardest part, and I, I wish more people in the West, more people in the West and people in progressive circles in the West, who talk all the time about decolonization and the history of slavery and the history of oppression and imperialism that w was carried out in our names. I hope they understand that, uh, you know, this oppression is still happening to many innocent people across the world and you can't just sweep it aside because of oh, the West also carried out its own terrors in history. No, you, you can't just be, that's, that's hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy to say simply because the West had a bad past, uh, simply because the West carried out terrible crimes in history, we, we have no leg to stand on when it comes to China's current crimes against humanity. This is, this is the line the Chinese government wants to try and put out to the world. It's a complete lie. Either you stand for justice everywhere, human rights everywhere, or you don't stand for it at all. If you're, if you're a Western progressive and you talk about human rights and justice and decolonization in a Western context, but you completely ignore it when it comes to China and Russia, then it's hypocrisy. You don't actually believe in human rights. You don't, you don't actually believe in justice and decolonization. You only, believe in, you only believe in it in a very limited context. This is something that we need to, we need to emphasize to many people in the West. This is colonialization. This is economic colonialization. This is ecological destruction. And they should care about this. They shouldn't be hypocrites and just look only at a Western context. Either you stand for human rights everywhere or you don't stand for it at all. Uh, who, are you talking to me or to Drew? I, I, I can just about hear you. Hi. Uh, my question to you, John, is that I mean you have been in the you have been in the Tibet movement and you have seen yeah. the Tibet movement yeah. for really, really long. And yeah. so um, and yes, you, you talked about climate change and yeah. then you also talked about uh, uh, change, maybe more uh, overview on the political solution. Yeah. But then other than that, I mean, do you see any other suggestion or things that we need to change uh, to bring our Tibet mov movement more uh, successful or, or to strengthen our Tibet movement? And my second question is to Drew. Uh, I work for International Tibet Network where we have our coalition of uh, Tibet groups. Uh, we say around 120 something, right, yeah. uh, but uh, most of uh, them are uh, not really active. Yeah. Uh, and then another challenge that uh, we see is that we have a very, uh, I think, uh, very less of young people getting involved in the Tibet movement, yeah. especially from the Tibet support groups. And uh, so, I mean, so um, so my, my question to you is, I mean, now nowadays everyone is worried that how to draw, you know, more supporters for the Tibet movement. So. Uh, I mean, to your opinion, uh, how can we have more younger people, you know, having uh, involved in the 
you know, Tibet movement. Yes, yes. If I can answer first, yes. uh, uh, attempt to answer first your questions, um, to take almost your last point first, um, most people in the West are very ignorant about Tibet. Yes. You know, it was never a British colony. Um, I spent a lot of time in the 1970s, 80s and 90s trying to educate people through newspapers and talks. And eventually, by the late 1990s, a lot of people in the West did know. But that has now been forgotten again mm. because there is no news coming out of Tibet anymore. So there is a big problem of education. How do we educate people in the West to know I also, like Drew, refer to the China as an empire, the Chinese Empire. And Tibet and, and Xinjiang are colonies, of course. But that, has, that term has not been generally accepted. So that's one thing. Now, to come to our first point, what can Tibetans do? Um, I think there are a couple of things which I think are important. I think opportunities for greater freedom and democracy and independence will come and I hope they will come fairly soon. You, you as Tibetan people have to be united. Now one of the problems with Tibet is it is a vast area and there are many differences of opinion within Tibet both in terms of regional differences, you have Utsang, you have Ando, you have Kam, you have also different relationships with China. Utsang has a different relationship from Kam and Ando with China. In addition, you have many religious sects, and the Chinese have always used money as a form of leverage. They have given money to certain monasteries to gain control, to gain um, support <coughs> for China. So, my advice to you is, you, all Tibetans, you are all Zamba eaters. <laughs> this unites you. All Tibetans have to be united. Strength comes through unity. If you are arguing among yourselves, that is not good. So Tibetans, whether you come from Kham or Amdu or Utsang or Ngari or wherever you come from, you must be united for democracy. That's the first thing. When you've got democracy, then you can settle your problems. Okay? My second point is this. When you achieve independence or genuine autonomy, I recommend very strongly that there is a separation between the Dharma and the Songdu. In other words, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he, he is a great, he is a Mahatma. He is a great soul. He is, he is admired all over the world. He is the unifying figure for Tibet in the way that King Charles or Queen Elizabeth was the unifying figure for the United Kingdom. The Dalai Lama is the figurehead. Everyone is loyal to the Dalai Lama. Okay? But political decisions should be made by the people, the Zongdu. Because political decisions may be wrong. And you have to be able to correct decisions. When the wrong decisions are made, you have to be able to change your government. So Tibetans, this is very difficult for you. Because all Tibetans love and would never want to quarrel with His Holiness. Quite right. But when you become a political entity, you must have a Tsongdu which makes decisions and they must be capable of being changed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? That goes with democracy. Yes. Okay. Oh, that's. I, I completely concur, John. I mean, that's very wise. I'm very encouraged to see how His Holiness has delegated power to the democratic representatives. Um, it's a very wise thing. It is, it is a way to keep your political entity strong, the ability to remove and change a government when needed. That is something that, that can ensure you know, political decisions 
are much more effective. And this is what ultimately is the major problem the Chinese Communist Party faces, the major problem of the dictatorships in Russia and Iran. When you can't change the government, then corruption swirls everywhere and they're inefficient and the rulers don't have an ear to the ground. They don't understand what's happening on the ground to, with the local officials. This is what's happening with Xi Jinping right now. He's surrounded by yes men. He's surrounded by all these people who worship him almost as, as an emperor. No one can criticize Xi Jinping to his face. And so he can't correct a decision like COVID zero lockdowns. He can't course correct until it's too late. And this is ultimately what is going to undo the dictatorships, the, the ineffectiveness, the inefficiency of it. Look at Russia. They thought that they would steamroll Ukraine. But Putin didn't understand that half his army had been eaten away by corruption. He didn't know that corruption had rotted away his military. He didn't understand that his military was far less effective as, as, than he thought. He didn't understand that he didn't understand the, the actual effectiveness of the, the Russian state. And so this is the thing that ultimately takes down dictatorship and it's why di democracy is so powerful and effective. And it's why the democracies ultimately oversaw the, the democracies faced down the Soviet Union and it collapsed. And the democracies faced down the fascist dictatorships of World War II, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, they collapsed. The democracies can persevere because they can course correct, they can, they can, they can get rid of the inefficiencies of government. And, it's very, and uh, exactly, the Dalai Lama, he is, he is a Mahatma, a great soul, and he's very wise, and he's, he's, he's very wise in that he delegated power. It's an amazing thing. Um, He's democratized the Tibetan government in exile. This is always, the, ch the Chinese government always tries to put out its propaganda saying there is no democracy among the Tibetans. It's an absolute lie. The, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has democratized the Tibetan government in exile. He's a very wise figure and he, he democratized the government in exile, which completely destroys the Chinese government prop propaganda narrative. When you ask me, um, how do we get more young people in the movement? This is a very important question. Um, I, and exactly as John has said, unfortunately, many people in the West are ignorant. Unfortunately, the ignorance in the West is, is just incredible sometimes. Sometimes I think, sometimes in moments where I, I might feel down and dejected, I might think maybe, sometimes when I'm, when I'm feeling down, I might think if I had to ask, if you had a hundred Australians, would even a handful Two or three would even would even a handful understand what's happening in Tibet. Would even a handful understand what's happening to the Uyghurs? Sometimes I'm not sure. Sometimes, sometimes the ignorance is just so great, and there are a lot of people who they, they've they've got a monetary in, interest in not looking into this. Unfortunately, in Australia, China is our largest trading partner. All the top Australian billionaires make their money selling mining material to China, selling rocks to China. All the all the top universities, they're so dependent on Chinese student fees that they've basically shut down independent critical China scholarship in our universities. If you look at the situation in Australia right now, <coughs> all the critical scholarship that is taking place against the Chinese government, it's being produced by independent scholars, it's being produced by independent think tanks. It's not being produced in the universities because unfortunately the universities have basically made it impossible for people to criticise the Chinese government. Look at what they did to me, they tried to expel me. University of Queensland is part of the Group of Eight in Australia. So they like to say that the Group of Eight is like the Ivy League like the, the top universities in Australia. And they tried to expel me because I was so loud at trying to criticize the Chinese government. So we're facing a lot of ignorance and it's an uphill battle because there are a lot of people who have a massive financial stake in ignoring these issues and trying to, trying to pretend that these issues aren't, exist, aren't in existence. The, um, the beautiful thing is that young people do care about social justice. Young people do care about fighting colonization, fighting for environmental justice, fighting for human rights. Young people in the West do care about this. If you look at Australia, there, there are sometimes, you know, the climate marches in Australia will attract you know, hundreds of thousands of people into the streets. Um, marches for women's rights, marches for human rights. They, they attract a large, marches for, you know, indigenous rights in Australia, fighting against colonization, fighting against the history of human rights abuses. They attract hundreds of thousands of participants in Australia and predominantly among the young people. And so I think part of it is education. If young people can be, if young people can be if we can explain the issue to young people in a way that they understand that Tibet is also an ecological issue, an environmental issue, a climate issue. Tibet is a fundamental human rights issue. Tibet is a fundamental issue when it comes to humanity, social justice. If they can understand that it's, it's a fundamental issue when it comes to decolonization and fighting against the long history of racism and imperialism that we all abjure. If, if, we, can if we can explain it to young Australians and young people across the world in these terms, 
then the good thing is the audience already exists. There are already millions of people across the West, e even in America. Look how many tens of millions of people went out into the streets to support Black Lives Matter in America. And they just need to be, they just need to understand that this is an issue very similar to Black Lives Matter in the sense that indigenous, you know, in, in the sense that there are racial minorities that are being brutally repressed and persecuted. There is a brutal history of colonization. There's a brutal history of even, of, of imperialism. They just need to be, we just need to communicate and educate people to the extent that they understand that and, and also, they have to understand we are complicit as well in the West. So, so there's, there's this idea that, there's this idea, unfortunately, among some people in Western progressive circles, where they th seem to think, well, the West had such a long history of colonization and imperialism and oppression of minority groups across the world, has such a long history of human rights abuses, and still, Western states still commit human rights abuses. They seem to think, well, then we are in no position to criticize China for human rights abuses. We are in no position to criticize any of these states on human rights is issues because we don't have a leg to stand on. This is some, sometimes an idea that people in Western progressive circles unfortunately have. And they have to understand that human rights either are universal or they are nothing. You can't just say, I care about human rights in the West, I care about stopping imperialism and cultural domination in the West and nowhere else. You can't just say, I will care about Black Lives Matter, but I will throw it to bed under the bus. You can't just say I'll care about Black Lives Matter and environmental issues and climate change, but I will forget Tibet, I will forget the Uyghurs. You can't say that. It's hypocrisy. Either these ideas are universal, they apply to all people everywhere who are subject to persecution and oppression, or they are nothing. And we have to understand as well that we are, we are also complicit in the West. This isn't just an issue where you can bracket it off neatly and say, oh, well, that's China's issue and we should focus on our own issues. In, in the West. You can't say that because every Western country has China as their top as their top trading partner. If China is our top trading partner in the West, the US, China as a top trading partner, Australia, top, China as a top trading partner, Europe, China as a top trading partner. If this is the case, then we have to understand that through business and through trade and through commerce and through our investment inside China, investment that props up Chinese Communist Party rule, we are morally complicit as well. The Chinese Communist Party would not be as strong today if Western investment had not propped it up. If the West hadn't poured in billions and billions, possibly trillions of dollars into, the, into China after, in the aftermath of Tiananmen Square. What a horrible mistake on the part of the West. What a horrible thing that the West has done. It makes us complicit in the crimes that occur. You can't just bracket it off and say, that's, that is occurring in China and we should focus on our own issues. You can't say that because, as, as John has said to me, you know, we're, we're all buying Chinese goods all the time. Our, our Western businesses are putting billions and trillions of dollars into China. We're propping up the Chinese government through this massive trade and investment in, in commerce. And so we are complicit. The crimes in Tibet, we are morally complicit in them. The crimes against the Uyghurs, the genocide, we are morally complicit. Because we're helping this government, we're supporting this government in its brutality. How many Westerners, um, I mean, you know, how many Western countries, companies have been actually complicit in, you know, Uyghur concentration camps, Nike using Uyghur slave labour, Apple using Uyghur slave labour. How many of these corporations are complicit in the crimes against humanity? And so we can't just bracket it off and say, that's an issue for China and we need to focus at home. No, we're morally complicit unless we stand strong. So this is what we have to teach young people. We have to teach young people, we have to stand for justice because either justice is universal or it's nothing. And we also have to explain to young people, this is not just an issue for China, this is an issue that concerns us too because we are morally complicit in this in the massive amounts of business and trade we do with China when these crimes against humanity occur. First thing you said that young people have to be educated. It's a, right, right now it's the age of smartphones so young people their their concerns about life and uh, their priorities may be very different from the older generation. Yeah. For example young Tibetans living in India their, their concerns would be like making a living in, in, in India because now they are, f they are from India, they live yeah. here, they're born here. So their concerns would be how do I make a living yeah. in India how, or how do I get a job in India or get out of India. So the real education of youngsters as you were talking about would probably have to be of young Tibetans living in Tibet because they're the ones who can really affect uh, how things change. Because for you, like I said, young Tibetans living in India, for them it's now, the concerns of India are more important for them mm. based on their socio-economic uh, standings where they are right now. Uh, secondly also, like India has accepted, the Indian government has accepted the one China policy since 2003. So uh, 
we we have a few concerns with uh, border clashes with China, but still India maintains that one China policy. Uh, go going forward, uh, you think in India Indian government will have to change its stance, become more aggressive towards China, or uh, uh, but but re econ economic realities uh, are are a hindrance for Indian government to do that because our trade is very dependent with China. So. How, how, how does the Indian government actually balance the two, uh, the Tibetan issue as well as trade with China? Yeah. Can I say uh, something on the Indian point? I actually want to know, India has been very strong when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party. It's one of the only countries in the world that has banned TikTok and all these Chinese apps. Mm -hmm. um, we have a hundred billion dollar deficit, trade deficit with China. With yeah, uh, of course. I mean, nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect. It It is a start. It is a start that they've banned a lot of these Chinese apps. They've... I mean, Modi did not meet with Xi Jinping. Unfortunately, my Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, met with Xi Jinping and smiled. Um, at least Modi didn't. Um, the Indian government's been... It's not enough, but, I mean, it's, it's encouraging that, they've, that they're trying to take steps against um, Chinese government-controlled apps, um, that they're not, you know, fawning over Xi Jinping at, diploma, at diplomatic meetings. Um, but as you said, of course, it's, it's not enough. It's not enough. It's still a $100 billion trade deficit. Um, when you say that India will have to become more aggressive with China, it's, it's not the case because China is fundamentally the aggressive party under the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I believe that the Chinese Communist Party is locked into this path of aggression because it has these internal contradictions and tensions at home because this is a dictatorship that does not rule with the consent of the people. And so Xi Jinping, when the economy slows down, when the, demo when the demographics start sliding, he has the incentive of starting wars abroad and going ag and sparking aggression abroad. And this is what happens with the wolf warrior diplomats and, you know, the border clashes in India. They had to kill, like Ch Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party decided that they would kill Indian border troops to try and prop up their rule at home. They wanted to strengthen their rule at home by trying to start wars of aggression. And so, I think it's not a matter of India becoming more aggressive towards China. I think China is locked into a path of greater and greater aggression because the Chinese Communist Party is facing economic headwinds, the, their economy is slowing, their demographics are, are incredibly bad, unfortunately, because they had the one, chi they had the one child policy for decades and there's now, there's now tens of millions of missing workers all across China and tens of millions of missing... Um, the, d the demographics are terrible. And so they're, they're, the Chinese government starts wars of aggression and starts fighting against governments abroad, trying to prop up its rule at home, trying to fan the flames of nationalist aggression. And I think, I think it's almost a matter of time for India and all these other governments, no matter how much they try and increase trade with China, no matter how many governments want to go back to the old days of trade with China, like diplomacy with China, the, the fundamentals are, are different now. And China will only continue to be more and more aggressive. And the, the democracies all across the world, it may take time, but they will wake up to this fact. This is what I think will happen. What do you think, John? Uh, I, my views differ a little bit here from Drew's. Um, I, I do not think we can blame the West for not being educated about Tibet. There are 198 countries in the United Nations Tibet is just one, and it's not even in the United Nations. How many people know about East Timor? Yeah, true. Why should people know about Tibet? There is no reason. We do no trade with Tibet. So I am not as optimistic about that particular point. I'm always optimistic. Uh, I know, you know, you can be over-optimistic. Um, I, I, I believe, and what I share with Drew completely, and with you, I believe that the Communist Party will fall but it will fall not because the west was educated about tibet but because of discontent in china yeah. that is what will cause the communist party to fall not us yeah. but the chinese i will say one further and very important thing probably you know a play by bernard shaw called pygmalion my fair lady there is a line in that near the end where the professor chastises the girl, the young woman, for having no morals. And she says, morals, governor, can't afford them. In other words, morality is something you can only afford when your stomach is full. When you're poor, morality takes a back seat. Now, China is the factory of the world.
It is not going to go away. No matter how much we would like it to go away, that is not going to go away. China c produces and is going to continue producing long after I'm dead goods that the rest of the world will want to buy. So we are all going to want to do business with China. Okay? So from that point of view, it is hopeless. I mean, I can remember way back in the 1970s and 80s when I was a member of the Tibet Society, we thought, can we have a boycott of Chinese goods? We decided it is a waste of time. No one is going to stop buying goods from China. How can you stop people buying when it is cheaper? In the end, it is your purse which dictates your morality. And as long as China produces cheap goods, we are going to do business with China, irrespective of the morality. So the hope lies within China. Chinese people themselves will bring down their own government. We need to be on the side of the Chinese people who want democracy and freedom. Can I, just can, I, can I follow up? On yes. Sorry? Can I follow up on that? Yes, yes, of course. Like you're saying the Chinese Communist Party will fall from within yes. because of discontent. Yes. But what is the alternative to that? Sorry, what is what? What is the alternative to the Communist uh, Party in China? Because the Re Republic of China, Taiwan, the Taiwanese government, yeah. their territorial claims are even larger than the Communist Parties of China. They even claim areas in Central Asia, more areas <laughs> in India. In South China Sea, Taiwan claims more area than what the Communist Party of China claims in South I China I think sea. some of these claims are totally unrealistic and right. you don't need to worry about them. <laughs> if I could just make it's one, a good point. If I could make just one last point and then I will shut up. But the Indian government has tended in the past to tilt towards Russia. That may be a mistake. I think India buys quite a lot of its weaponry from Russia. It is rubbish. Yes, of course. It has been proved in Ukraine how much superior Western technology is to Russian. If I were President Modi, I would tilt towards the USA. The USA is much more likely to guarantee the freedom of democracy than Russia is. So my advice, I am just an outsider. I just say, you know, as an outsider, but I love India. I would put my faith in the USA, not in, Rus not in Russia. That was not my question. My question was, what is the alternative to the CCP? That's a, that's a good point. <laughs> You're, you're right, because s this, is, this is the problem, right? We can't assume necessarily that the fall of the Chinese Communist Party will be replaced, will be replaced with something better. And this is what happened, unfortunately, in Russia when the Soviet Union fell. The Soviet Union fell, and what happened? Democracy didn't come to Russia. It was just more forms, it was just a, a new form of dictatorship and, you know, brutal economic repression as well. Um, kleptocracy, theft from the people. And this was a failure of the West because the West, the West did not necessarily encourage democracy in Russia. During those early years when the Soviet Union fell, there were a lot of people who rushed in to make money, but there weren't many people necessarily who were concerned about democracy in Russia. And it fell back to dictatorship. And then 30 years later, look what happens, the invasion of Ukraine. And there are very powerful forces of nationalism and racism inside China. And it, it's a concerning thing because if the Chinese Communist Party falls, there is still the possibility that its replacement could be worse. Its replacement could be potentially more racist, potentially more Han dominant, Han centric, potentially more focused on an ethno state, more focused on imperialism. It's hard to imagine because it's almost as bad. It's, we're at a situation where it's almost as bad as it can get inside China because the, the brutal racist and colonial policies, they're almost as bad as you can get. It's full on genocide. But it is, it is a concerning prospect that the replacement of the Chinese Communist Party could be, could be worse in the sense that it could be full on fascist. I'm not sure. I, I've, I've thought about this at length. I've, sometimes I think, could it really even be worse than what we currently have? Because what, what we currently have is even just full on genocide. Could it get worse? But it, it's, it's, it's a good point. So you have to, you have to ensure, as, as you're pointing out, the fall of the Chinese Communist Party it, it has to come it has to coincide with you know the growth of democracy in China and not just a majority one a majority fifty percent plus one type of majoritarian democracy it also has to be a democracy that respects and appreciates the rights of minorities as well 
because unfortunately you get a lot of these types of fake democracies i mean Putin still claims to rule as a democratically elected leader even though we all know it's fake but but his is a regime what that he he they they think because they get 50% plus one of the support of the population then they can brutally repress minorities and brutally brutally crush you know ukrainians this is this is a worry this is very this is a very terrifying prospect that we have to consider and so it's very important the chinese communist party when it falls we have to be pushing and supporting as much as we can the forces of democracy and the the democrats that respect minority rights as well not just not just people who not just chinese nationalists who might come into power democratically but still support the repression of tibet and the repression of the uyghurs it's a good point about the republic of china people don't realize that its territorial claims are still you know they still claim mongolia they still claim the south china sea they still claim east turkestan and tibet as well the republic of Ta- the republic of china the good thing is the dpp in taiwan i think they are very much moving away from that that type of politics the dpp are much more focused on simply you know democracy in taiwan and it's really the kuomintang the kmt that are now like the pro china nationalist side i'm very against the kmt for that reason because you know if the kmt sometimes you get people who say if only the kmt had won the civil war in china the kmt were brutal to the tibetans as well the kmt would have carried out brutal repressions of minorities just as well and you know look at the brutality that they waged on innocents in taiwan the white terror the kmt can be just as brutal as the ccp at times in history and so it's very important what it's exactly what you're saying when the ccp falls we have to make sure it doesn't it's not replaced by something worse we have to make sure that it's replaced by like a a real genuine democratic movement a real genuine democratic movement that respects the rights of minorities not just not just a chinese nationalist movement that places a democratic veneer on chinese oppression of tibet and east turkestan etc good point thank you so much very fine thank you Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank